His pen game is as versatile as his pen names. He is an MC, a master on the mic, a chosen one of some sort, being able to move the crowds across the continents with his music. Later channeling that very mastery to start a record label and clothing company called Flip the Bird. The level of ingenuity and originality reflected not only with his music, but with his designs on shirts and iconic sneakers he created with Run Athletics. He created a blueprint to how an artist from Hawaii could make a lasting impression and impact on a wonky music industry without compromise. Always staying low-key like the brother of Thor, Tasho Pierce. Hey. What's up, Tasho? What's up, Cavett? Man, what a what a kind intro, man. I'm going to have to sample that. I'm going to need that. <laughs> nah. Oh, low-key like the brother of Thor, man. You took it back. Dude, I, I was trying to write this intro, and I'm like... <laughs> Hmm, I need something. I, you know, Tasha got a lot of lines. I'm like, <laughs> and I, I kind of remember that one because now that Marvel, you know, the MCU is huge, right? Yeah. And like that yeah. one, that one was like a slow hitter for me. Right. <laughs> when I first heard it, it I didn't, I, it, it didn't catch me until later. And I'm like, look, oh, man, I got man. Re- what verse was that? That was a good. There were some good lines on that. That was that, um, that was on Ram and Punishment. Oh, okay. On. Um, uh, ringleader, ring. Oh, ringleader, ringleader. Yeah. Okay, produced by. That's Sizer. No, that, no, that that's was actually um, Mr. Rio. Mr. Rios. Yeah, that's Mr. Rio. Yeah, yeah. I would say, like, you know, if you listen to the album, like that, there's no really uh, other signal than Honolulu. But if there was, it would be ringleader. Oh, nice, I think nice. That's, like, the that's, only that's other a one dope. That's that like a dope album, though. A little catchy feel to it. Yeah, that's <laughs> real. I didn't. I, I'm kind of bummed. I don't know where my LP went. It's somewhere in the archives. But because I've been doing this. This podcast, and I was like, "Oh, I'm going to interview Tasha." I was like, "I got to pull it out," but I couldn't find it. And I was like, "I got hey. you, bro. I got you. I got. I get you the instrumental too. That's, that's the rare white label." Yeah. Anyway, let's. <laughs> how you doing, man? I'm good, brother. Thank you for bringing me here, man. No it's, problem. It's an honor. Yeah, and congratulations on this whole, uh, you know, partnership. This yeah, is yeah. Dope. No, I'm stoked, man. PBS is uh, showing up for uh, Hawaii Hip Hop. I need uh, I need you to get me a drop from David Attenborough. Oh, <laughs> I, I want a drop, too. It'd be dope to be like... Grew up on that guy, yeah, man. Like, you're listening to Alanui Mele. <laughs> you know, with like bird sounds in the yeah. back. <laughs> Shout out to David Attenborough. <laughs> but anyway, let's take it way back. So you grew up in Kaimaki, or was it... Uh, we bounced around a lot. I was so originally born in Japan. Right. Uh, my mom, my mother's Japanese. My dad is Haole. We, um, he grew up in, uh, he went to high school in Japan. My, my grandmother was a writer for the Japan Times. Uh, Jean Pierce, she wrote like an advice column. So he lived there 17 years, spoke fluently, went with my mom down to uh, Iriomote, which is famous for the Iriomote wildcat. It's a small, tiny island off the coast of Okinawa. Nice. No electricity. Super primitive. My dad was the only gaijin, non-Japanese guy, and he's plowing rice with a water buffalo. Whoa. This is like during this uh, like hippie days. Crazy. Yeah, and then uh, I guess it didn't work out, whatever, between him and my mom. He split, uh, moved to Hawaii. Uh, we started out, you know, I think we lived in like a little studio in Mo'il, and then we moved to Kalihi for a little while, and then eventually uh, ended up in Kamuki side. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ended up going to Kalani? Uh, yeah, went to Kalani, graduated from Kalani High. Yeah. So in, in Kalani, what was what was your first experience with hip-hop? Was it before you got to high school, or was it during your middle school era? Probably middle school, yeah. Um I mean, originally, you know, it was like way back, like second, third grade. My first like big moment right. was, was the Run DMC concert with ZZ Top. That that like totally blew my mind. Was that here? Yeah, it was oh, at Aloha Stadium. And you actually went to that? Yes. Dang. Dude, it was incredible. Ah, I didn't Dude. go to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to guess it was like 87 or something like that. You wow. can check the facts on that. But yeah, uh, young eight-year-old show was just like. Your dad took you. Uh, actually, my my buddy's dad, Hoala's dad, uh, Mr. Grevy, was always super cool. He took us around and, and and took us to do stuff like that. But yeah, I remember having those tapes, Run DMC, you know, like you know all these uh, Eric B and Rakim, Beastie Boys, License to Ill. You know, that was I think that was already like that was past King of Rock. That was right. uh, that was Raising Hell already when that. They did the big. They were doing the stadium tours, yeah. you know. At that point, with ZZ Top. was it ZZ yeah. Top opening for Run DMC? 
Uh, the way around. To, I don't remember. I know uh, Henry Capono was on the bill, too. Oh, that's crazy. He was the opener. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty random Only lineup. in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but I bet you everybody loved it, though. Hey. I don't even remember that. I had to, I went back, and I was like, I wanted to buy the poster, so I was like searching on YouTube, but it was like way too much money. And oh, I, so I, I'm not has on the YouTube, poster. Searching out on eBay. But uh, yeah, I found, I found the poster, but it was like way too much. Ah. But then it's, uh, Capono was on there, too. But later on, yeah, we were, you know, the first guy that kind of brought me back into hip hop was probably Aaron Hao. When I met him, we were kind of all like punk rockers. We hung out at the Pink Burger King on uh, University. Yeah, yeah, okay. Going to punk rock shows. But at that same time, we were starting to listen to like more edgy, hardcore rap like Ghetto Boys, what year NWA. Was this? this had to be like, shoot, 90? Yeah, 1990, yeah, because so maybe like freshman, sophomore year, we started going more into hip-hop, and, you know, I think 90, by the time 92, when Farside dropped, we were like, that kind of blew our mind, and then there was like hieroglyphics and all those, you know, we were listening to like really hardcore rap, because that energy kind of reminded us of punk rock, and it's like rebellion and just like rage, and then we went into like, Oh, these guys are like actually saying some stuff, and yeah. like you know, you just kind of absorb all their words and their patterns, and and then we were starting to freestyle and develop our own, you know, skills. I don't know if you could call it that. At that time, it was very rough. <laughs> Raw, like, uh, yeah, just riding around. So in the punk rock yeah. scene, did you see like John Davis and those guys there yeah, too? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, they were like they were straight edge guys at a certain point, hardcore guys. You know, like uh, Dave Suzuki, all the you know the legends of the. You know, the punk rock scene, like MUG, all those. We'd be at, you know, those shows checking it out. And, like, yeah, it was it was unreal. Those was good times. Like, with I don't know how we were able to do all those things. I think we had uh, fake IDs, so we were able to sneak <laughs> in and see some of these shows that well, we probably should have been It was, it was simpler at. times back yeah, yeah. in the mm-hmm. late 80s, early 90s, being just a, a rug rat mm-hmm. running around in town. I mean, I, at that time, I... I I think, I think I moved from Kapuhulu. I used to live on uh, Montserrat. Oh, right. By on. Diamond Inn. I moved, I moved 90 to West Side. Oh, so, right. like, I literally probably missed you guys. So, yeah. I had to catch the bus in from the West Side. From like, I lived in the Village Park, by Pahu. I was driving to town, but I grew up in the town. So, I was supposed to go to Kalani yeah. or Kaimaki, but I made it to Kamehameha. So, like, my, like, and then, which, which was kind of crazy because in my head, I'm like, dude, if I, if my parents didn't get divorced, and if I stayed in town, I would have probably went to Kalani because all my friends was at Kamki Middle School. Mm-hmm. I said, would I have been in the Human? <laughs> <laughs> you definitely would have been down. Bro. We would have like, been crew. <laughs> I was thinking, no, I really thought that way because I'm like, dude, like literally, because I was all about skateboarding and hip hop and punk rock, everything, right? Yeah. So I did a random hypothetical, like, you know, you know, alternate universe. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, hmm, would Kevin be the catalyst and would he be part of the Humanakas? <laughs> because I was I would have been there. We we're like around the same age. So yeah. I mean, skateboarding hip hop was all relative. It was like there really wasn't a hip hop scene. I mean, maybe there was, but we were not we were too young to kind of like know about that. Right. Like if you wanted to be in a scene, it was either like punk rock or you're gonna be like a metalhead yeah. or like uh um, yeah. yeah. You know, surfer, whatever. There's all these other cliques, but there wasn't really like a, a formed hip hop scene at that so time. So Kalani was just like you, Hao, anybody else was like the actually early... Hao was Roosevelt. Okay, yeah, and he, um, and then me and Malala, fun guy. We were right. at we were at Kalani, and then Mr. Rios and Todd G. They were at Kaiser. Um, was this through proximity of Kami Kamiki? I mean, uh. Roosevelt, Kalani, Kaiser, just being in that kind of general area that brought you guys together. Pink Burger King brought oh, Pink me Burger together. King. Yeah, that was the <laughs> connecting factor. And then I, I, I don't know how we linked with Mr. Rios and Todd, but I knew that we were already like we we're like listening to like dope hip hop, like right. more underground stuff at that time. And I know that like Todd, Todd G, he had like ties with the far side at some point. He was like maybe a backup dancer for a video or something Crazy. before he came to Hawaii. And then Mr. Rios, Gijo, he came from New York. So we kind of felt like, okay, we have these like guys that are actually from the mainland that that know hip hop, you know, and, and we felt like a certain connection, like closer to the essence, you know, just, right, right, just right. having them around. Because being from Hawaii, yeah. you were hungry. 
You yeah. wanted more, and we only yeah. could get it on your own TV raps or mm -hmm. whatever you see on TV or magazines. So yeah, when your you own got, TV raps was yeah. huge. That was something that kind of like leveled the playing field to where we were watching and listening to a lot of the same stuff that they were watching. Right, 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 right. To, you know, so when these guys from the mainland come through, you're like, oh, they were there. Mm -hmm. Like, let's pick their brains. Yeah. So that was way before Humanakas. That was just, you guys just... Yeah, that was high school. Probably, you know, that was sophomore year. Sophomore year with uh, Met Gijo. We're recording in his uh, bedroom. He actually had a four track. Wow. So it was crazy back then. You know what I mean? That is. Yeah, so he was like... We were messing around recording over there. And then because of that opportunity to kind of like practice, we were able to like start doing little showcases and shows. And um, you remember your first show? I think it was a talent contest. Like a it, brown bags? or It was, it was no, it was Jack Jack the Rapper. And it was, it was crazy. Wait, it Jack was, the Rapper in Hawaii or Jack yeah, the Rapper? No, it was Jack the Rapper in Hawaii. It was crazy. Was that the like, same Jack the Rapper that they had in the mainland? I don't know, but maybe it was just like right. a spinoff. But yeah, it was it was pretty eye opening. There yeah. was like some brawls and some crazy stuff what? going on. Yeah, any notable guys that you remember from then mm. that kind of peek out now? Uh, there was one guy who I caught later on. He was he always had crutches from Kalihi. I forgot his name, but he was. Oh. I've seen him at later shows too. Like he kept going for. a he while. He started doing tattoos, I think. Oh yeah, I, I think so. His name, but he was tight. Like if anybody, I was rooting for him to win. Besides us, we didn't win. Humanakas didn't win. That's the group we uh, we all came. Wait, okay, so wait, Humanakas. Let's rewind. Was that Jack the Rapper? You uh, they invited all the MCs. You had to go to a back room. Do you remember? Is that the one? And everybody had to cipher in the back room mm. first before you even get on the stage. Do you remember that show? Was that? That's not the UH one, is it? No, this was okay. like, I do remember being at that. Because I think me, oh, that was, see, this might have been 94 or 93, 94, 95. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do remember the, the, the guy, the MC that, with the crutches. And I remember mm -hmm. you guys there. Mm -hmm. And I was there with either EP or my other homie. Yeah. And, you, and there's like all the, I remember just being a lot of MCs going into this back room. Mm -hmm. You had to battle there or something. Then they picked you out and then you had, got to go on stage. I don't know if you remember that show. Dude, but I remember I you guys rolling deep. Yeah. And, and I remember that. I remember, I know that guy's name, man. It, if, I know he's a tattoo guy now. Oh, okay. But I know specifically who you're talking about. And he yeah. was the sickest out of all those kind of more of a gangster Khalid yeah. guys. So I think all his boys were there. Ricky Boy, was that his name? Yeah, I think that's right. And they were definitely, uh, you know, they, his, he was deep. His crew was deep. And yeah. somebody up, went up there and there and threw up the wrong sign. And he, I just remember him, like, walking through the crowd like a pinball machine. Like, punk, punk, ping. <laughs> like, it, was not, it was not good for that guy. Uh, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, but that was our, you know, that was, like, getting our feet wet. And then I think our first, our first, like, we did our own shows, like, here and there. Just, like, open mics, try espresso, of course, you know uh valentino's that was like the st the start of like stone groove family manifest right. you know all those guys ciphering with with you know jamal kilowatts and and uh everybody that was uh around on the scene at the time did you guys link up yeah. with uh so before the the, the humanakas was branded as a crew mm -hmm. uh did you guys hook up with anybody like danny one before that size okay uh that was so humanakas was already a crew and then we met was one okay okay so that became our high state family that's when we started branching into the high state family and buzz one through him that opened up our affiliation with like homegrown massive okay danny one that's trans right skills, skills. yeah all those guys and then you know later we had uh uh one night stand so right. that opened up our affiliation with rude funk that's right. going to be like static. sweepy, static, yeah. those guys. Um, did um, did mm -hmm. Buzz bring in, was um, Casper Kimo already down with the Humanakas or did he kind of come in with Buzz through VM? Yeah, through VM. Like, I definitely think we should, They we need a moment just to talk on those guys. Because yeah. yeah, like <laughs> yeah. Buzz, like to be honest, like my, my reputation like as a battle MC was like kind of like a bulldog, kind of like, you know, you know, give me the mic and, and, and just kind of not a bully, but like more of an aggressive persona. Right. And I got all of that. I adopted that from Buzz just like because being around him, 
you know, like when you first meet him, you're going to freestyle and he's going to be like, if you start fading or showing the slightest weakness, right, right. he's going to start rapping over you. Oh. And it's like, and all you yeah. know, like he just had these techniques that would just like get under your skin, but at the same time, like made you better. Like, and the same thing, like Buzz was like somebody that like pushed you to get better. And then when Casper, I first met him, to me, his style was like, the illest style, like mm. his, his just his voice and the way he put words together, like in this cryptic kind of dark uh, style that he had that just really met matched his whole persona. Like his, that was somebody that was like super proud to have him in the crew, and it made me definitely step up. Like those ciphers between Humanakas and VM is definitely what helped us get better. Because uh, we already had our own kind of style. Like if you think about the Humanakas right. and, you, and you break it down per member, right? Okay. Like you got to talk about like fun guy, right? right? He's 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 like he's like the dirty bastard of our crew, like right. the ODB. He's just raunchy and like kind of like bust the influence and just like over the top. There's so no fun guy's name is Malala. Malala, Malala yeah. fun guy. Yeah, oh. he's he's the main guy that would like king of styles like he would just go anywhere with his style mm, yeah, and yeah. just like and you know he had the big afro and the big personality and the big stage presence anywhere we went th that's the guy that people remember you know yeah. uh and then of course hao to me is like the backbone for the whole crew he's like the most like balanced and like you know well-rounded artist he got the voice he yeah, has yeah, the yeah. subject matter he's the only uh hawaiian mc in you know in the high state family and you know he he sprinkles some of that but it, he's like a, a nice medium between like backpack and more like uh just like hardcore hip hop so, right 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 uh and then of course Taji he reminds me of like the wordplay the high vocabulary but with like that that soulful kind of like pasta noose kind of yeah, like yeah, big brother, you know, like trying to give you some guidance and, yeah. and like, you know, when we were listening to hip hop back then, you actually like felt like you were learning something and getting guidance mm, from some of these yeah, MCs. Definitely. Like, right. You listen to an album, you're like, oh, you pick up some gems and it's like you carry that with you your whole life. You know, like it's like. Uh, was Hao's name always Hao? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then Taji Aaron, was. Yeah. Aaron Kavai, oh, yeah. And then uh, Taji was Kid Kalua when I first met yeah, him. Yeah, he was Kid Kalua <laughs> before he was Taji. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then I Ideal, Idealism. Okay. He was like, our he was our street cred because like, <laughs> he was literally always in the streets with everybody, right, right. whether you were uh, any. Uh, extracurricular, let's call it entrepreneurial <laughs> endeavors uh, that you were taking part of right, right. Uh, out here in these streets. Like, you knew Ideal. You knew Moon. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then... Uh, Shout out to Moon. Yeah. And then, Love of course... Guy. Yeah, dude. He's off file. He's... In, he's uh, Vegas? Vegas. I think eventually we're going to do this and we'll do it with all the Humanakas. And we'll sick. do... You know what I mean? That'd be sick. We'll get we'll get Moon down here and that'll be the, the real story because uh, I don't know how much... In my memory, I have right, it. If right. we combine all of us, we have a good uh, yeah. story to tell. Um, and then Mr. Rios, he was like just, just such a good-hearted, warm person, and just like kind, quiet. But like his beats, like sp spoke volumes. He was like the mastermind behind all of our early projects. His digging, his ear for digging was like mm, unreal. Yeah. You know, he's using a lot of jazz. Loops, because of course we listen to Tribe. I think Pete Rock was a big influence for him. So a lot of like jazz loops, but he was finding stuff that would like, I would hear him loop it, then I would hear someone like on the East Coast like loop the same thing later right. on. Like his ear was like top tier. Right, right, right. Um, so that would be the Humanakas, and that's Vandalist Minds. And then later. Uh, so VM, VM Vandalist mm -hmm. Minds, was it just Buzz and Casper? There was uh, Albert, I think, was affiliated, and then also um, Sean Kelly. Sean Kelly, yep. yeah. Shout out to Sean. I don't know what exactly their role was. I know they were just like squad. I know Sean, like, like he got he bombed with. Oh, okay, the, on the yeah, writer side. On the yeah. writer side, and writer I think side. he played bass. Oh, okay. I played I instrument. Skate, skate. Yeah, because I remember uh, I skated with him early on. Then he went to Roosevelt, I went to Kamehameha. Mm -hmm. Then we linked back at uh, Funk Pistol. Oh, and he's like, yo, Kevin. I'm like, Sean, what are you still here? I thought you went back to New York. He's like, nah, dude. And he he told me, like, you gotta come out with us. I'm gonna um I'm gonna link up with these guys, you know, like these guys. And he started talking about you guys. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, word, word. We never connected. 
that's what I mean. It's like so many missed opportunities. Like that was high school. So I was like, he was, he was at Roosevelt. And uh, he, he said, yeah, you got to come out to these ciphers because he, he was getting up, with, getting up, meaning like tagging VM. Mm -hmm. He's like, my crew VM, da, 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 da. And I was like, okay, cool. But I never, ever went to one of those, those like just, you know, meetings of the minds. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I'm like, dang, dude, that was like another opportunity. <laughs> I could have like linked with the Nakas earlier, just VM early. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But shout out to Sean. He, has, he owns a skate shop in California now. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, uh, I used to kick it with him whenever I went to New York. Yeah, stuff. he's OG, yeah. Zoo York, uh, rookie, uh, New York skateboarding. Yeah. You know what I mean? those. Yeah, really good guy. Um, so that was VM. And mm -hmm. you guys also had uh, Six Sense, right? Okay, so yeah, Six Sense, that is like, yeah, those are like, those are like the real Kapuhulu, you know, they're the, like the real Kapuhulu Gs, you know, like they were really in the game. I just basically, Romeo, I knew him since uh, Prospect, since second grade. Right. He was like my best friend since like second grade. We played like, uh, we played for the St. Louis Orioles oh, <laughs> over crazy. at Connie White Park. You know what I mean? Like yeah, he was yeah. always like super athletic, talented. I think it was, he was like for our first couple years quarterback at Kalani, but he was a... Uh, my boy, and when we started listening to hip hop, I like put him on to like lower end theory, and like changed his game, like his whole idea of what hip hop was. You know, like they're just listening to his like straight gangster right. stuff, and then they're like, "Oh, this is dope." And then he would start to you know freestyle whenever we we'd hang out on Hayden Street. Yeah, we'd all just sit on the wall there and like freestyle and stuff. <laughs> and uh, and then him and AB at one and right, yeah, right. But Ro was just crazy off the head, just super sharp. Like, he was one of the nicest, like, just off the dome. And then he, when he translated that into writing, he was also sick. Um, excuse me. A.B., Ant, he came, Ant Bone came from, he was from L.A., I think. Uh, he's a little bit older. He had some stripes. He was definitely, like, OG. But he he definitely had, like, kind of like a spice one chop to right, his right, flow. Right, right, right. Yeah, and then there was uh, Scott Sick, who's also right. from Kapahulu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he was nasty, bro. He had an ill voice, and his, his flows were, like, super sharp. So we were stoked to bring them into the crew. Uh, and then, of course, Size 1 was, like, the architect, the, the guy who knew all the history and knew everything about Hawaii hip-hop, knew everything about East Coast hip-hop, yeah. West Coast. I think he worked at, at Tower Records for a while, and he was a producer, and he was someone that, like, when he entered the fold, he elevated everyone's uh, game because he had, like, a certain uh, perspective and a skill set that, like, you know, and a discipline that made us How did who, uh, who introduced you guys to size? I think it was, like, Todd or, like, Gijo met him at um, at Tower Records. And then they're like, oh, yeah, I met this guy. He makes beats. And we went over to his house. He was, like, I think on, like, uh, Pensacola or something. Where was he? Pecoy right. went to his apartment over there and we're like listening to the beats and we're like, oh, this is different than Mr. Yeah. Rios. Mr. Rios is real like loose and flowy and like funky and like, but Tide, I mean, size was just like real concise and like that like boom bap. Yeah. Like you could you, that foundation because he he trained, he went to New York, he he was a disciple of phase two. Wow. Uh, yeah. So size had that like that that New York essence you know yeah, his chops his, his, his ear for <clears throat> chopping up samples and recreating beats mm -hmm. like i mean he's gotta be i mean he, he's like almost yeah the unicorn of mm -hmm. hawaii pop because he's he's been there in the 80s with graffiti mm -hmm. well skateboarding graffiti i mean right mc production mm -hmm. like you know and he's been there at every single point and he's kind of like a quiet it's kind of chilling in the shadows almost like you know like what was that um like a ninja almost, yeah, you know, just chilling. Definitely, but he's like at any moment he can come on and bam. Yeah, <laughs> like, like right now heat. he's got beats like oh. folders of beats right now. We're I mean we're we're actually um, in the talks. We're we're not in the talks. We actually started recording a new Invisible Ink project. Just uh, me and Size back yeah. together working on that. So oh, like sick. his beats are like phenomenal. They just keep elevating. So that's pretty much. I mean that's like the Humanakas High State. That's High State Fam, of course, with the affiliates of Rude Funk, right. and then, and then of course, Fame came into yeah, VM. Yeah, yeah. How I did think Fame? How did Fame? He was he the was with Buzz and and Casper. They became they he became their main producer, and then of course broke off later into Mo Illa Pillas. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. 
I think Fame is like top five producer in Hawaii. I'm gonna go, you know, Mr. Rios is up there. Yeah, and yeah. Of course, Size is in there, but Fame is right there. I mean, just like. those three guys alone. I mean, there's like you know, Danny Wan got beats, mm-hmm. but I, I mean, like, yeah, Fame. I think Fame is like on the mic mm-hmm. and production. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> he's can't. like a Kanye for like. Dude, yeah. he is yeah. man. I see that guy like often now because his son goes to Kamehameha. And my son goes to Kamehameha. Oh, so we always bump into each other. Yeah. And, I, and it's like I train myself not to call him fame. fame. <laughs> Jesse. <laughs> Jesse, fame, <laughs> Jesse, fame. It's like I can't help it, man. Yeah. And the funny part is when I see certain individuals like you or like fame, I, I have lyrics in my head. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, I, I hear like Jesse fame on the top of the food chain. You know, like yeah. I hear that when I see him. Yeah. When I hear see you, like I, that lyric, that <laughs> the low-key lyric came into my head. So it's kind of funny how... No matter, although we're like, you know, getting our grown dads on, you know, yeah. adult, um, cause, what did they say? Cosplay. Mm-hmm. Cosplaying as adults yeah. and fathers yeah. that it never kind of leaves. Still got a zipper in the back of us and a little B-boy hops oh, out. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, and then, of course, we got, you know, Jimmy Taco when he came in. He became like our go-to engineer. Like, I think I met him through Danny. They had a studio in IAF for a little while, but... Danny One's studio was like the first, like, even though it was like we were recording in the bathroom, it was still like a more of a real studio <laughs> yeah. than we had ever been <laughs> before. Like been a four track and a mic. Yeah, you know, you just can't you just can't record after lunch. You got to wait a few hours because <laughs> it's gonna be a problem in that booth. Yeah, so classic. <laughs> so, do you remember your first big show with the Humanakas? Was it the Cool Old Ranch one, or was there a bigger one? Okay, I mean, that's big, big. But for us, any show was right. big. Where if we're like the, our first, like, actual, we're doing a rap show with an actual rap group that is like yeah. certified was, I think, uh, Far Side and Booyah Tribe. Okay, yeah. At, uh, at Campus UA. Center. Yeah, Campus Center. Right. Do you remember that show? I always tell this story. I was there, I seen you guys perform. I remember Far Side going on. And like all like the backpackers were all in the front. Mm-hmm. Then when Booyah Tribe, I don't know if you remember this, when Booyah Tribe came on, it was almost like a party of the seas. Like the gangsters went forward. Yeah. And all of us guys were like into the shadows. You like that Homer Simpson meme? Yeah. I don't I remember that because I was at front. And then when Booyah Tribe came on, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go step back a couple, couple steps here. Cause all the gangster fools were like going up to the front. And I was like, but it was dope. Because you had like you, Humanakas. Right, and then you had Farsa and Buya tribe, both yeah. from the West Coast. It's like instead of instead of the bush, like the the backpackers were like fading into mayor rights. No, yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> but you know what? There was no violence. Yeah, and it was like almost, and there's two two groups I actually listened to. Yeah. So it was dope to have like a local act that I look up to, like yo man, that's sick. People doing it like how I'm doing it, and then see Farsa was just like. Pfft. Mm. Crazy, and then you have Buya Tribe with straight gangster, but yeah. being able to coexist with no violence that was dope. I think about that bizarre ride, and that's like to me, is it's a very pivotal album. Like, I just like the, the, how old I was, and just listening to that in my headphones over and over in high school, and just like really like just absorbing the, the essence of like hip hop, like made me want to do it, and then also like finding out later that Slick. A guy from Hawaii did the artwork. Mm, yeah. That was actually like my first like, wow, superhero Hawaii hip hop moment of like, this guy's from Hawaii. He's doing artwork for this group that's like my favorite group yeah. right now. Yeah. And it's like, and then and then seeing like, those are like, to be honest, like my first heroes in hip hop weren't from the music side. They're from the graph side, like actually seeing them do that. Right. And then like that, you know. Uh, seeing um, Catch with his piece inside the Source magazine, yeah. right? And then it is Source of Rap Pages. But then, like, finding out, like, that piece is, like, in the back of Kalani High School. Yeah. High School, yeah, like, yeah, finding out, yeah. dude, this is that from the Source. What? Yeah. It's like these connections that are, like, it is crazy. it's closer than you think. You right, know, right, there, right. there is it, you know. Yeah. It, makes, it, makes, uh, it makes it more tangible when you're doing, if you're an MC or an artist, you're like, dude, Slick, he's from here, like. Yeah. He just did the, my favorite album's cover. Like, yeah. I mean, when I found that out, too, I was kind of blown away. Like, what, dude? Like, how does that even work, you know? Such a legend, man. Salute. Yeah. But uh, so talk about, I want to talk about the, when you guys did Cool Old Ranch, though, because that. Okay. Yeah. How was that? Like, how did that even happen? Was that, um, 
Uh, Sick Dog. Sick Dog, yeah, yeah. I think the first one we did, Kualoa, I don't know if it was the... I know we did Wu-Tang at... Uh, it was After Dark. Mm, that okay. was like the first big, big yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then... I think I remember, there was like a cypher outside too. There's DJs outside. There was, uh, I think... Um, Drama then were spinning outside, right? Oh, After yeah. dark. They had like a, a tent outside yeah. with a DJ and an open mic. I remember outside and then the Wu Tang was inside. Yeah. I don't know if you that's that. how it was always said. I remember there's lots of open mics yeah, out yeah, there yeah. out in the outside of the club. Uh but I think the first No, not, I'm thinking of the other the one we did with uh, Black Eyed Peas and De La Soul. That was with Sick Dog. But okay. uh, the big melee, that was Golden Voice. Yeah. When Wu came out, damn dude, I don't even. Did we open for that? I know we were there. <laughs> I know we opened for Wu. Where they did two shows, right? I know they right. did After Dark and Big Melee, but man, it's just so long ago. Wait, did I'm, you guys do the? Did you guys do the? Were you guys, were you guys, did you guys rock Big Melee with Black Eyed Peas? No, we didn't do. No, we did another show. It wasn't Cool Oil Ranch, but we did one. It was with uh, maybe it was Cool Oil. It was Black Eyed Peas and De La Soul. That was our first like. What was that? What was that one at? That was the sick dog one. That was the sick dog one. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. But Wu Tang was crazy because that was like, like, people were like, we threw our tapes out in the crowd and people were whipping the tapes back at us. <laughs> and like, we're halfway through our set, it's like, Wu Tang, Wu Tang. And we're like, man. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, we went through our whole set. We we got through it. And then I think another big show was like The Roots over there at Ooh, After Dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that because Malala hit the fire dance on stage. I know that they were not. We're not supposed to do Whoa. that in a sold out room. Yeah, yeah. And then he dropped one of the knives <laughs> on the stage. We're like, <laughs> and he picked it up. We recovered, but it was crazy, dude. He's like, flipping that. Yeah, was that planned or he's like, I'm no, doing no, it? No, no, no. I think he just did it, yeah, dude. It was in like, typical Malala uh, fashion. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I'm stole doing this the show. Dance. Stole the show. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, that, so those were, that was that era. That was the era. Those were the groups that we, you know, opened up for and then as my you know career moved on i opened up for different artists and and but always as the the opening act you know it's it's just it was always a dope opportunity to like so was there ever an official humanaka album yeah we always the tape the humanaka's tape came out in 96 okay yeah just that tape yeah and but we circulated we took it out to the west coast right yes traveled yeah we took it out there and people were like people were feeling it yeah yeah. So then the Humanakas, then how did it kind of like just kind of dissipate? Do you remember? Uh, I think we just, everybody was kind life. of on. Yeah, life, different pursuits, different values, not values, but different. Um, I don't know. People were just kind of like their goals shifted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People wanted to do other things. So it, it was like we we're all still homies, but I just was like 100% like after Freestyling and Species, right? right that right. was like. Our last, probably when we were still. So, what, uh, explain to the, the people Humanaka. what free, Freestyling Species. So, that was when we were talking about High State Family. By the time Freestyling Species came out, Humanaka's was uh, Malala and Moon and Mr. Rios. And there, there was, it was had kind of split off. And then I had become Invisible Ink. Okay. But Freestyling Species was like the crew album, the High State album. So, okay, if you guys. Okay. All of the, you know, how I was describing all the MCs in High State. If, if right, you ever right. wanted to hear, like, what I'm talking about, about everybody's style, it's all on that CD, right? The, the Freestyling Species. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, have everybody on that. Um, and then from there, actually, there's a song with me and Taji called Tropical Deluxe. Okay. And at that time, we were always, as a crew, High State family, we would always migrate to uh, Mr. Rios's house every Friday and there was a station on Maui that you could pick that would broadcast the wake up show. Right, right, right. So if you went to the east side, you could hear the wake up show. And we listened to that religiously. You know, nice. as you know, that was like yeah. the proving ground for every MC, you know. So we went there. Um, and I think we had given it to Sway. I met Sway. He came to Hawaii. There was a barbecue somehow. Somebody knew him, met him. We had a barbecue. I uh, gave him the, I think it was the Freestyling Species. They end up playing uh, Tropical Deluxe on the Wake Up Show. Nice. And we're in the, out at Gijo's listening to it, and we're bugging out. Did like, you guys know oh they were going to play it? Or? No, we just gave wow. it to him, and then it came on. And then we're like, okay, okay, we got to give him some more stuff. And then yeah. from that point, 
is when I started, uh, I was working on Invisible Ink. Um, and that's when we printed our first vinyl. So Invisible Ink was basically me, Gijo, and Aaron okay. in the first Upper Hand EP. Uh, and we sent that out to Wake Up Show. We actually sampled um, Carmelita's voice. If you listen to The Longest Mile, it's like ah, 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 Akira 8. That's oh, from nice, Carmelita nice. from the Wake Up Show talking. And then, so uh, then that came out. I think they played One Drop Ink off of there. And then the next, we put out another EP. We went to LA. This is so that's 98, between 98 and 99, we released two EPs in that one year uh, on vinyl. And then 99 was, uh, we went out to actually South Central LA. Size was living up there. Size joined the group. So now we had two producers, two MCs. He produced all of that one, all of the. Those walk, are all just Walkman EPs classes. or is there a full LP? No, nope, they're just EPs, uh, like four or five songs each. Is there any missing yeah. so any songs that no one's ever heard? Or? Uh, probably, you know, we shelf, I shelf a lot of music, man. Just, I have these certain sta standards right, and it's like, right, I right. mean, it's dope, but it's not dope enough type stuff. So there's like a lot of demos floating around. But. You guys are in South Central with size. Yes. We're like, it's like Slauson and Crenshaw, Damn, like those areas. That, okay. Yeah. But it's like Baldwin Hill. So it's like right. maybe six blocks walking from there. Uh, but yeah, so we were, we were over there recording and definitely like, like, those songs ended up like being some of the the some of the best songs I think in my legacy, especially like if you look at Pure right mm, now, yeah, if you search yeah, Invisible definitely. Ink Pure on YouTube, there's like the comment section goes crazy, like people like just loving it, not even knowing we're from Hawaii, anything about it. They, right, they right, think right. that we're all from New York when they listen to that song. But the comments are like, this is like inspiring. This is that true hip hop. This is that. And it's like, you know, these people don't know anything about <laughs> yeah, it. So yeah, it's like yeah. unbiased. So it's like whenever I have like a, a day when I'm feeling grumpy or low, I just go in there and read the comments. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> hey, man. You got to self-affirm sometimes. Yeah, you know, you know what, what I mean? mean? But yeah, reflect. so that's, I mean, that, and then that, so that, was, that song just took on a life of its own. Um, and then I think at that point, we opened up for Hieroglyphic Souls of Mischief at The Wave. And that was the crazy show where we wore like these painter suits we thought it would look super cool, but it ended up looking just like a bunch of blue Teletubbies on stage. <laughs> but, but I remember that show was so live. I don't know. Like we, I just recently did a show with Souls of Mischief. And I feel like our music and their ethos is kind of yeah. like intertwined. Like it's the right mm, crowd yeah, for yeah. our for our music. And uh, every time we do shows with them, like the crowd is so receptive and so hype. Like and I remember we I actually stage dived. That was the first time I stage dived. Nice. I looked like a little blueberry floating around on the crowd, <laughs> and then threw back on stage. But we were so hyped, like just to be like have our own music on. Right, wax, right, you right. Know? Yeah, and, no, that's that's yeah. a major. You know, that's a major thing. You know, I really mm -hmm. think that's kind of well. A lot of new artists they don't actually. You got to believe first in mm -hmm. your craft to yes, put sir. up that money to get it pressed. Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean, and vinyl is hot right now. Like. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Like vinyl sells. I don't care what people say. If you believe in your art, if you're an MC producer, put it out in vinyl. That's like the proving ground to if you yeah. really can move and sell. I think besides maybe DJ Paco in right. this room are the only hip hop artists that actually release vinyl in Hawaii. I don't know that there's anybody else that has wax. I mean, only oh Todd G has wax. Todd G, too. Yeah. Rise Up. Oh yeah, that's rise true. Up, that's rise true. up, that's rise up, rise up, Taji. Shout out, uh, direct descendants. Yeah, yeah. Oh uh, uh, shoot, I mean Paco. Um, There's only a handful, man, who took that, went that extra mile, you know, to do uh, that. Yeah, I mean, and that's not it ain't <laughs> final till it's vinyl. You know it ain't what I mean? Final till it's vinyl. Yeah, I, I'm a stern believer, and every time I got these young guys coming to me, asking me, I'm like, put on vinyl, and you only gotta make a hundred pieces. If if you if you don't, hundred is nothing. Yeah. And it's pure profit. I always tell them, if it's about that money, you can make your money quick mm -hmm. and fast. And you're foreverly embedded in the annals of hip hop. <laughs> For real. But anyway, so <laughs> back so back to that. So you're doing the Invisible Ink. Yeah. And then when did that kind of not slow down? When did the shift or the movement from that to becoming immersed Tasha Pierce? Okay. Uh I don't know. We had like with Invisible Ink, that was a tremendous run from like ninety eight to ninety nine to two thousand. We were able to like that was the same time 
in that window, I appeared on the Wake Up Show two times. Right, right. Uh, you know, I did like we did numerous trips to the the West Coast. I remember going on to uh, KUSF in San Francisco uh, with Winnie B and ciphering with LP from CoFlow. And this is L- this is Fun Crusher EP LP. Mm, nice. This is nice. raw. Yeah, raw LP. Like the rawest. Yeah. And I had to, you know, back and forth with him. Yeah. It was it was like you know super intimidating, but it's like you know we had to step up and, and rep for the city. That was like probably one of the most important ciphers, you know, because it's also outside of Hawaii, getting right, out to right. the mainland mm. and getting on the radio. It's yeah. not just like in the club; like it's actually everyone's hearing it. And then the next, probably most important, was this is all during Invisible Ink was going to the Wake Up Show um, and and freestyling uh, with Pharaoh Monch. Yeah. And we were at a table just like this. It was me, Pharaoh, Declaim, this kid Spontaneous. And I was going around. And uh, the funniest thing I remember is like when we're all rapping, we're like, Pharaoh's probably like, who are these crumbs? You right, know what right, I mean? Right, like yeah, he's yeah, yeah. like God level yeah. MC. Organized and like, who, who yeah. are these guys? Anyways, we're like rapping. And I remember him distinctly while we're rapping. He had his like Rap Pages magazine. He's like, Flipping through the magazine oh, while we're all doing our parts, right? Wow. And we're like, yeah. But I mean, that made me even more like it kind of like lit a fire under me. And then my verse from that freestyle ended up being on like the best of wake up show freestyles. Right, right, right. So it's like that that was super gratifying, you know, just to know that like, okay, we with these guys that are like my idols, like some of the top tier lyricists and, and able to like not like I'm not saying like I'm as dope, but I'm hanging with them. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like I'm in, I'm that's, in the conversation. That's all you really yeah. want coming from Hawaii yeah. is respect, mm-hmm. right? And be yeah. able to to people to say like, yeah, that guy can yeah. hang. Yeah, you know, that's, you know, we I mean, we know we can. Yeah, we you know got, what I mean. But just to get that that nod, especially from Sway, Pharaoh, mm-hmm. LP, you know what I mean? You don't want anybody calling you whack. No, no, you, you get kicked off. That's the wake up show, <laughs> yeah, bro. Yeah, you yeah. can't be whack. Yeah. You whack, you're getting called out. So it's just you getting... you going to this these shows um solo or size with yeah, you? Yeah, no, yeah. Size was with me. This is Invisible Ink. My man Hakeem was with me, who was our like liaisons when we we're recording in LA. He became my manager later on, even with uh the immerse stuff. So I think after Invisible Ink, <laughs> reconcile back with the Huma. Like the whole time I'm those are my boys, you know. I love those guys, even to this day. Like Malala, Aaron, Gijo, those are like my brothers. So we're like, okay, you know what? Bygones be bygones. Let's get it back together. So yeah. we record a, a whole other album. Oh, crazy. I put Invisible Ink on the shelf. We have all this momentum with Invisible yeah, Ink. Like, yeah. We could have like kept going. Like people thought Invisible Ink was going to be the next thing because yeah. like we were doing stuff no one had ever done. Right. Like, yeah. Getting it like on these, these radio shows and having vinyls. But okay, let's go back. Let's do some more Humanaka stuff. We recorded like a whole album. Same kind of thing happens. I don't know. I don't exactly, I don't want to say exactly what the differences were, but it's just mainly like just, I guess like some people were not ready to 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 go and just put 100% behind the music and the effort that it takes. Right, they, were, right. they were sidetracked with other pursuits and hustles and things like that that were like. Because you were coming from being deep in the sticks. Mm-hmm. Deep, you're, you're at the wake up show. Mm-hmm. You're rhyming. You're, mm-hmm. you're recording in LA. You're you're removed from Hawaii. Yeah, that Hawaii hang back, hang loose. Yeah, mentality. You're like in LA yeah. recording, going to work, go, uh, hustling the yeah. vinyl at the wake up show, spinning, rhyming, writing. You come back to Hawaii. Let's do this, guys. So already you could see like you're there. I like I'm. Well, let's do this, guys. Humanakas. And then you know, being from Hawaii, I know we know. That a lot of times that's the downfall of a lot of Hawaii artists. At the end of the day, I think the project is dope and I think that it will come out. It was just not like, it wasn't, it's just I couldn't, we couldn't, I don't know if somebody got, maybe somebody got locked up. I know there, there was like, <laughs> there was a definitely a huge hurdle that we, yeah, couldn't, yeah. we couldn't get around. And there was like, I didn't want to wait for, for it to like resolve itself and then for us to move on from there. Like, so it became another thing where it was like kind of like just a demo that got that got put on the side, like right, right. That got you know like albums get shelved all the time from yeah. major labels, but you know that's kind of what happened. And I I still feel like uh, it wasn't really necessarily my call. It was just like 
if I wasn't going to put it out, nobody was going to put it out. Right. right. And I was like. Because you had the means, you created the pipeline, mm -hmm. the connections, yeah. created the relationships. So you're like, okay, yeah, if we're going to do this, it'll be me. But if I'm not gaining 100, 100, then it's like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's definitely probably maybe one of the, you know, regret that I had like that, that we weren't able to bring that to fruition. Uh, but I think it's still, it's still possible. And then I guess at that point, I like, i still felt I had some momentum. So now we're going into 2002, 2003, you know, 20 years ago. Um, Crazy. I start working on my own thing. Okay. You know, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it myself. I start immerse. Crime spelled backwards. Right, right, right. I create the logo for Flip the Bird. It's the upside down bird with the X's and the I's. Nice. Um, we. So is the crime spelled backwards because like you're basically flipping, flipping what's happening, you know, the negativity. Yeah, we had certain things. That, yeah, we were all like, you know, doing a lot of things that were like probably detrimental to our, you know, our future right. basically we were not going down the right path so i wanted to flip that and turn mm, that yeah, into yeah. immerse myself in music and right. hip-hop that's dope whereas you know all the homies weren't ready to do that everybody was still you know pursuing their other hustles and right, stuff right so, right right and um not to say that i was completely done with it but i had definitely prioritized the music over everything um and then we made some t-shirts to promote the album release um, and we had a good buzz for the album because, uh, you know, the Honolulu was released. We did that one on vinyl. That was the first release right, right. on Flip the Bird was the 12-inch. The and, um, you know, through the Wake Up Show, I was able to connect with Rhett Maddock, who mm, produced the— to Rhett. Yeah, Rhett Maddock. He's like— to me, he's like the quest love of the West Coast. Yeah, he's like yeah, the encyclopedia of, of hip-hop knowledge. Uh, but anyway, he produced uh, the title track, Rhyme and Punishment. That was on the 12-inch. The um, and, yeah, Honolulu took off. That was crazy. It just, like, ended up on all the, you know, on all the radio stations, you know, started getting even more shows. It became, like, kind of, like, woven into the the fabric of Hawaii hip-hop. It became a part of our, definitely, our definitely. story. It wasn't just my story. It was, like, all of our story. Right, became, right. Because, you know, Hawaii, we remember those wins, right? Like, Honolulu was a win. That was, like, yeah. we got a W that day. And then it's, like, you know, like like BJ Penn, when he when he won the title, like, Max Holloway, going back to, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like Sid Fernandez. <laughs> nice. Like, yeah. anything. Like, we remember our wins, right, you know? Right, like, right. That's, that's a dub. That's a dub for Hawaii. You know, all of those things. And that was like, that was one of the dubs that we got as a hip hop scene. You did, know, when of you course, made that, when you made that song, did you envision it to do what it, what it, what it did? Or no, you just said, I'll make a song for my city. I did. I wanted to make an anthem for okay. Hawaii, but I didn't think it was going to be like, I didn't know it was going to be embraced like by, by everyone. But that was like, you know, I was, I wanted to make a record that wasn't just all battle raps that was just in like because that's like one of my favorite albums of all times is, is like uh, no need for alarm dell and oh, he's yeah. just like chopping, chopping off rappers everybody. heads like every song <laughs> yeah. if you listen to rhyme and punishment there's a lot of that yeah, yeah. on there but it's it's also like i wanted to have some concepts and and show my versatility on that as album, a writer is it all um is it uh gijo and size Yes, and no. Brett Maddox. And Rhett Yeah, Rhett Maddox okay. did that one track. Um, did the, so the relationship with Rhett, you met him through the Wake Up Show, or was I, it through Visionaries coming to Hawaii? He probably, it's probably when they came to Hawaii, yeah. I know we, um, I don't know if this was before, we toured with them. We did it like three dates with the Visionaries. Nice. And I, I don't know if you know, it's at a certain point, uh, up above, re-released Honolulu. Right. The 12-inch, and we did a, a remix with Babu yeah, on the yeah. B-side. Right. And then that. Shout out to Doug. Yeah, right. Doug Cato, yeah, yep. they, they got behind it. Um, but to not to sidetrack too much, I want to go back to, so we printed up the T-shirts to uh, for the album release party. Okay, hold on real quick. So um, you made these shirts yeah. trying to promote the album yeah. and promote the record label. Yeah. The, the <clears throat> Flip the Bird, you, this, this imprint that you created. Yeah. Flip the Bird, you're like, yo, I need shirts, represent. That's yeah. pretty much what it we started had, as. Yeah, we had seen a glimpse of what it's like, like to – to see that you could do it yourself through brands like Shaolin, you know, right, Sha right. Shout Manifest out. and Slick. They they laced us with gear. And even before that, if you look at the Walkman Classic uh, CD cover, 
uh, the inlet, it has a photo of us, and we're all rocking Circo. Yeah. And that's the first streetwear brand that I remember from right. Hawaii. That's Keone Payton. Yeah. Shout out to Keone. Yeah. I mean, that was a huge inspiration. You know, actually, that's Casper's cousin, too. So, right. we, yeah, we, yeah. Uh, yeah, we had a, you know, history, too. We knew, we knew him, and that's how we ended up getting laced by, by his first brand. And then, so we saw, like, okay, this is possible. So then I made the shirts. Um, all of a sudden, it started taking off. I, I, I realized, okay, we can start selling these shirts. You know, I, I can use this as, like, a viable, you know, source of income and a, and a way to, like, express my creativity through designs. Yeah. Um, uh, luckily manifest plugged me into JT, John Thomas. Mm, I was going to get into that. Yeah. So he was the man behind flame boy world industries. So big, big, huge designer. He's got crazy stories of like working for this huge corporation, uh, skate brand. And, and then he, he, you know, separated from them and moved to Hawaii, start, you know, wanted to raise his family here. Like so many of us do. Um, and, connected with him <clears throat> and we were able to like build this uh rapport like this chemistry between us where I could like just feed him I any idea and he'd right, be able right. to make it I, I imagine it's the same thing between you and spell oh, like yeah. I know like like they have their own ideas too but the the strength of the brand comes from when you guys are able to Definitely. combine the ideas and the talents of yeah. the the graphic designer so with that behind me i was pretty much unstoppable i felt okay we got some dope designs yeah, yeah, yeah. i think we were inspired by cause original fake bape okay i really love those brands but i could never afford any yeah. of those shirts yeah, like, same, same, so i was like yo same. i'm gonna just make my own shirts <laughs> exactly. that kind of look like that that match the same shirts right right ma- match the same shoes i would take it over to kicks hawaii took it to lalo that's when kicks hawaii lalo were together upstairs right um met ian for the first time and he was the guy who like Put me on game. He was like, "You can't be selling these shirts with the Hanes tag on it. Right, right. You gotta get your own tags." Sent me to Dana Labels, made my own tags, put them on the shirt. Started selling there, you know. Started selling information. Sarah's Surf. Boom! All of a sudden, you know, we're still doing shows. We're still promoting music, but like, I there's a reason I didn't put out any music between 2003 and 2008, and that's like <laughs> Flip the Bird was just like five had years. This, had a whole you know, moment where where it was like not only you'd be walking around on the west side and you see like a G logo shirt, like, you know, with the Gucci pattern. Like right, or right. You, you would see it like celebrities, you know, would be wearing it. Like not just um a lot of the artists when I opened up, I would give them clothes and then like Method Man, I'll give him a shirt and then right. he'll put on the shirt. Red man, I'll open up, give him a shirt, and then he'll end up taking a picture. Um but then as it progressed, we started seeing like, oh, there's, uh, there's Lupe wearing a shirt on. He's on doing a YouTube interview. Oh, right, right. Chris Brown with Rihanna wearing a shirt. Now I did not give these guys that shirt. Right, they right. just there's Mike Epps wearing a shirt. Like it just started like spreading like that. Uh, and but it wasn't like just, it wasn't just luck. It was like a lot of hard work. I literally put the brand in my backpack. I think I went to the Crooks and Castles website and I looked at their stock list, right? All the doors that they that carried their brand, and I just like literally flew to those stores, and like with a backpack full of gear and a, and a line sheet, like stores like uh, Ubic in Philly. I went there. Nice. Boom! They're carrying Flip the Bird. These are like the main yeah. places you need to be in to be a legit streetwear right, brand. Right, right. This is when the, the hype beast, before the hype beast, this is still yeah, like still. the streetwear renaissance, I guess you would call it. And then I went to Boston, Bodega, Ooh, you know, went over there. Nice. All of a sudden they're carrying our shirts. True in San Francisco. like the so, t- did, so did JT teach you about the line sheet or was that Ian from Kix? Uh, it was probably JT, I imagine. He's like, so how are you going to sell this stuff? I was like, I don't know. Just take <laughs> it. Well, you should probably make a line sheet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Right? What's oh, yeah. that? What's a line sheet? <laughs> yeah. Hey, yo, straight, straight up, straight up. Yeah. Shout out to JT, man. Like, yeah. I mean, when I remember when Tasha told me, I was like, hey, who designed your stuff? You're like, yeah, this guy named John Thomas. I was like, yeah. wait. John Thomas, Alva, skateboarding. Legend. I was like bugging out because I'm like, yeah. dude, he has his own move. Right. The, the JT, JT Air. JT Air. Yeah, right? it's a tuck knee. It's yeah. like a front side grab tuck knee. And I was as a kid, like, I used to do that move all the time. So I, I was kind of bugging out when Tasha told me about that as like 
a young skate kid, like third grade, like JT. And I'm like, he lives here. I'm like, dude, he designed yeah. your stuff. And I was like, I was, I was mind blown, you know, on this whole another path yeah. of outside of hip hop was skateboarding, which, you know, of course, Manifest, you know, Jeff Hartzell. Yeah. Right? Did he, he do any designs for you? Uh, we did a collaboration. We did that State is High. That's right. Yeah. Love and then he shirt. actually, uh, he did another one with Aaron, which is the logo for Invisible Ink with the, uh, the, it was our upper hand logo, which okay. was the two Spy vs. Spy guys, one yeah, with the mic. Yeah, yeah, well, That was one of our designs, yeah, too. Yeah, I see that. Like, yeah, uh, and then he actually was the first guy I came to with the Flip the Bird, and uh, he that ended up being a, a collaboration. It didn't end up being the main logo. Right. Uh, <clears throat> it was dope, but it was like, it was like, it was like abstract and super like it was a dope, dope logo. But I just wanted it more simple. And he's like, you know, dude, go. My boy JT just moved. Right, here. right. You should go meet up with him. So it's more yeah. poetry. <clears throat> Yeah, like that you was know, before, like, yeah, 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 when he was going into poetry from Shaolin. So anyway, so you're giving all this, so you're, you're straight up, uh, feet to the ground, foot yeah. soldier, yeah, hitting up all these stock lists, bang, 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 yeah. backpack, line sheets, MC from Hawaii. You're doing your thing, mm -hmm. music wise, yeah. But then you took a lick. You're like, dude, this clothing thing, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna run with it. Yeah, it just, uh, yeah, it made a certain level of. A popularity that I don't think I it went surpassed whatever popularity I had from Honolulu, which was probably like the apex of my uh, right, right, right. You know, music career. Yeah. So that that's I just pursued it and went all out with that, and like you know, so the, that opened up some of the biggest um, like moments as far as an artist meeting other artists, like you know, meeting Eminem for the first time. Wow. Like I met him at Avex Studio. He was out here with Dre. Um, in the studio, come out. The, he, he's standing there. His the manager's like, uh, so yeah, this is Marshall. Um, and I'm like looking. I'm like, oh my goodness. And I'm like, <laughs> like I'm in shock, right? And then the first thing he says, oh, you do that, uh, you do that flip the bird brand, right? I was like, yeah. I was like, that's yeah, that's my brand. He's like, yeah. Uh, Haley was just wearing your shirt the other day. I was like, what? Oh, like and then, you know, I didn't want to take up too much of the time when they're in the studio. Like I had just met him, but I just basically told him how much he influenced me as an artist and like that his music was like even a big part of the the inspiration of the brand and like, yo, thank you so much. Basically, you know, and then uh then I split and then I found out later, a few weeks later, like his the relapsed album came out and He's rocking uh, Flip the Bird on the inside. It's like him and Dre right. in the studio, and he's wearing our, our Producticon shirt, which yeah, is like yeah, yeah. it's like the Constructicons like yeah. from Transformers, except it was like an ASR-10 on the arm, yeah, NPC the on the chest, yeah. the speaker, so it was the Producticon, and he's wearing that shirt like on the CD cover, which was like insane. Like, And then eventually through, was it through AVEX, you kind of met Kanye? Yeah. Through that? Yes, yeah. Now those were, those were like probably the best years of my life. Like you're talking about like, you know, my best memories besides, like, my son being born, you know, getting married. Yes, yes, <laughs> Shout yes. Shout to Tracy, shout to Itaru. Uh, but uh, outside of those moments, like, you know, those are probably the, some of the best moments. It's like 2008, 2009, um, working, you know, not initially not working with. In 2008, during 808s and Heartbreaks, meeting Ye for the second time because the first time I met him, was at the Touch the Sky tour. I opened up for them at Blaisdell. Right, right. And then I gave him some clothes backstage, and then he ends up wearing those on uh, Wango Tango concert, like the '90s All Star yeah, shirt. Yeah, that's like, the shirt. That was like one of the, the that was the first big cosign. Um, that shirt. I mean, that shirt was that shirt was dope. Like the most uh, illegal shirt of all yeah. time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, the funny thing is, like, we had like so '90s All Stars was basically, if you remember, like. The NBA All Stars game, you'd get, you'd see like those Pele Pele type leather jackets mm, with yeah. all the NBA logos on the sh the jacket, right? So we want to do a '90s All Star. So it's basically we couldn't get the leather jacket that was not in the budget. So we did a T-shirt <laughs> and we put all the '90s hip hop logos on there. You know, whether it was like Gangstar, Freestyle yeah. Fellowship, you know, Organized Confusion, right. Tribe, everything. Certain people got left off because they were like on the cusp they're like these are more 80s artists so you know you gotta think like mm, run dmc right, right, right. public enemy certain like okay these guys are on this side but if we keep it straight 90s, 90s. 
And that shirt, like, it was controversial, right? Because, like, yeah, I didn't get any permission. But everybody that I met, like, I remember I met the alcoholics, right? And I gave them the shirt and their logos on there, right? right. And then, like, they're not tripping. They actually, j Row ends up wearing the shirt on stage when nice. they perform, you know what I mean? Shout the out to on, alcoholics. <laughs> the only time I ever had any, like, conflict with that shirt was, like, who, who I was gave it, it to... I gave it to Evidence. Oh, and but he's not on the shirt. Right. But he just had something to say about it. He's like, oh, he's like, it's like, hmm. It's like, Boogie Monsters, huh? <laughs> he's, like, he's, like, he's like, oh, you didn't. I was like, he's like, you could have put Mop. You're not going to be thinking about that. You'd be thinking about, like, the people you met, the relationships you had, the journey, the experiences. And, like, all of those experiences are, like, something that I, like, holds, you know, in my heart, like, super valuable to me like the lessons and just like spending time with those people that like I have so much respect for that like, you know, open the doors for so many people to like experience like the blessings of hip hop, right? Because like hip hop just makes you feel good. It makes you feel young. It gives you like right. all this inspiration that you can take with you. And like, yeah, so those those moments with those guys is like probably like my greatest achievement, just being able to kick it, kick it with those guys and, and, and actually, you know, creatively – build and make music like I remember like being in the studio with during Dark Twisted Fantasy and like for for the first you know long section of time I would just be on the couch on the outside not allowed in the main room but over time like I had gained access and been welcomed into the creative process and I'm like being in the room and seeing like Q-Tips over here the RZA over here Pete Rock you know and like even being able to like Every once in a while, like throw out a line and then seeing Kanye's eyes like brighten, like nine times out of 10. First of all, you got to be it's you got to imagine how like gut wrenching it is to even try to like suggest that an artist of this caliber would right. say something, an idea that you have to pitch it to them. Like, why would I? And then like nine times out of 10, he would say, oh, I would never say that. <laughs> like, he would literally say, <laughs> right, like, right. Your, your idea would get shut down, but you cannot just like cower and yeah, be like, yeah. you got to step up. You're in the room for a reason. So, you know, every once in a while, maybe a few lines on, on the dark twisted fantasy. I threw a line out there. I seen his eyes twinkle. He'll run in the booth. And he like said the exact same lines you know i'm not gonna nice. say what it is yeah, yeah, but yeah. like the studio rules you're not supposed to talk about anything that happened but i you know i'm i'm my mama like that's like yeah, yeah. real stuff that happened and it's like those are like super like gratifying and just like the experience of being around those guys i'm forever grateful to kanye will say whatever you you will about him i will never have anything bad about because he opened the doors yeah. he didn't have to do that he let right. me be in there i'll be there from Two in the afternoon to like six in the morning the next day, you know, by the end of Dark Twisted Fantasy, I'll be like going and like playing ball with them at the YMCA and then like going to the studio. Like I was like literally those guys are like family to me. Like I spent more time with them than I've spent with some of my closest friends. Because right, you think right, about right. like six months every day from like 2 p.m. till, till 4, 6 a.m. in the morning. Sheesh. Yeah. And then before that was, you know. 808 so it was like six weeks but yeah those guys forever grateful and even you know dilated Qbert, all these guys that are like legends to me and my heroes like that just means so much to like actually steal a moment of their time and, and have them like focus on my project this album this song and and create something like you know that will last forever hopefully that's huge man <laughs> you ever thought maybe you ever had that that inkling, maybe the thought that you were ahead of your time with the music, with the, the 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 marketing strategies? Maybe at the time you're not thinking about marketing strategies or line mm -hmm. sheets or clothing, like. But yeah. now that you can be older now and reflect back, you're like, dude, this, I did something. Yeah. You ever I think mean, you ever think like that? You do, you do, but then you know you have that idea of like you don't always want to be. I mean, I feel like definitely those are some of my best moments so far but I feel like you know there's always going to be better moments coming right. you know like life is like that you know that was just for that moment in time like definitely something I hold precious those experiences and but I don't know if I was ahead of my time I don't know if I like would be more successful now if I if I had all the knowledge to do I think right. it was just the right time to do all of those things without the clothing brand I wouldn't have been able to 
go in there and meet M and meet Kanye. That's kind of like how I got my way in the studio. Right, hey, right. I got this brand. Let me hit you off with some clothes, da 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 da. And that, you know, that was the right time and the right place. Because otherwise, if uh, maybe they're not in Hawaii, you know, at the same time I have a clothing brand, if it's later, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. all the timing, all the thing has to be perfect. That's why I feel like almost like the luckiest person in the world when it comes to like these those moments just like meeting those people like i may not have like i know i have a platinum plaque i don't have a grammy but yeah. i i don't like super famous but i almost feel like if i was i don't know if i'd be the same person mm. i don't know if i would still have value the same things i don't know if i would still like have this close connection with my family and and you know my friends i think maybe i would be a different person and not like, right, right, yeah, right. not to say that that makes you a bad person that kind of success but it definitely makes you uh focus on other things true yeah i mean you know how we are we like it's all about family that's why oh, yeah. i moved back home with my with right. my wife and itaru i want to raise them here you know definitely so. it's that hawaii hawaii yeah real quick we're gonna real quick real real i'm gonna rewind really quick yeah i want to talk about really quick run athletics and the shoes okay because i just need to know like give us a breakdown on that how that happened okay uh what, what era was what, time, what date well i'm mean, not date but what year Okay, that was 1998. I had met, uh, this is through Hakeem again, who was my manager at the time. We met Rashid Young, who was the president of, I think Run was the president, right? So it's Russell Simmons' brand. Right. He had Run Athletics, which was, you know, Run's footwear line. Rashid connects me. Well, we meet them in Hawaii. They love the Flip the Bird brand. They said, okay, we're going to make a sneaker together. <laughs> like, word? Wow. <laughs> like, well, like, just like that. Like, basically, yeah, they love the brand. They were like, this is like the streetwear renaissance. Everyone's yeah, doing collaborations. Yeah. Uh, I might have shown them a picture of, like, Kanye wearing it or something. Yeah, I showed yeah. them a picture of Red Man. You know, they're Def Jam, you know, basically. Right. Uh, uh, and then so then before they leave, they say you should meet Russell. Come to the Halekulani. I go there for for breakfast, and they're they're sitting there um, nervously. You know, crazy. meet Russell Simmons. I told him like you're such a you know important figure. Like listen to all the Def Jam albums yeah. and, and like like yo. Is there, I, I, I've told this story before. I basically said, is there any advice you can give me as like starting a streetwear brand? He's like, uh, you doing a, you're doing a sneaker with us, right? I was like, yeah. He's like. Uh, I think you're doing pretty good. I was just like, <laughs> you know, enjoy where you're at right now. Like basically nice. like yeah. take in that moment. Like we're talking about like those, the the journey, right? All those, you got to take in those moments yeah, when yeah, you have yeah. those wins. You got to like actually appreciate it, not just always be going for the next goal, right? Yeah. Like that. So he basically, that gem is like something that I still try to like communicate to this day. But so boom, make four designs, work with JT, crank them out. And then all of a sudden, like, yo, we got to make, um, we want to do some T-shirts to help promote this the shoe. So, boom, we're doing the collaboration, official collaboration with Redman. Wow. We did the, the, the How High shirt, but it's H-I, like for Hawaii. Right, right, right. And then we did the Mahalo Man. So it's like the Method Man logo, but right, it says right. Mahalo. And these are like official collaborations through Def Jam, through Run Athletics, you know, limited, probably like maybe 200 to 100 Ooh. shirts, you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, if you ever have any of those, like, yeah, I'll, I'll, buy, I'll buy it from you. you <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so the, those were, like, distributed worldwide sneaker boutiques throughout Europe, like Colette in France had it, like, uh, cool. in, in Japan. So that was, like, a huge thing. So four designs, yeah. but they chose two. They chose three. Three. Yeah, the one they didn't choose was Koa Wood, which was, like, oh, ocean okay. and, like, <laughs> it's like brown and blue. But the one they chose were uh, Shea Vice, right. kind of pastel colors, and then Bird of Paradise. Okay. Just kind of like it's kind of like some ice cream right. like kind of vibes. Yeah. And then the the number one was the Humu Humu Nuku Nuku Apu. Right, right, right. Which I today still think maybe we should have the Guinness for the longest name for a shoe. Maybe <laughs> it's like it's not the longest thought, name for a fish. I thought that was genius. When I when I seen it, I was like, dude, this is this is freaking genius. Like who like it looks like the way it was designed like who 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 like who would think the fish sense. would look cool as a sneaker right but right. it does it looks cool as a well, sneaker well that's why I was like, saying like ahead of your time like I don't know if you see it but from the outside looking in and knowing you and I'm like yo Tasho I don't know if he, he knew him like you're ahead of ahead of your time I for appreciate shoes, that brother for all of that stuff you know what I mean 
No, but you're just actually, yeah. I think I was the first like independent hip hop artist to have a sneaker deal because I feel like Jay Z had a sneaker, but he was already signed. You know, there wasn't any independent artist ah, with a sneaker deal. So yeah, it was way was, before Kanye and yeah, like yeah. And his sneakers weren't even that fresh. Like this is like fresh and and held it down for Hawaii. Yeah. And you had on the on the the label on the tongue. It said High State, right? It said High State. It had the the Legacy. little tag with the Hawaiian yeah. Islands on it. Crazy part about that is like I was I was a little shorty, second third grade, like holding up my sneaker at, like to run. Like when he said, "Put your Adidas up in the oh. air." I was putting my shoe up. It was I didn't have the Adidas. <laughs> it was some other shoe, but whatever. <laughs> held it up. You know, and then like later on, you know, I got to do the sneaker with Ryan. Like so that full was full circle. Like, yeah. And how many sneakers were made? So I think they have five hundred pairs of each one. Do you have you have a pair of each one? I do. Yeah. Okay. For sure. And I even have the prototype of the oh, Koa Wood. One. You better, but I think oh. it's just the left foot. It's like I can't hey, you got to send me that picture. I want to post it on Light Sleeper. Yeah. I was gonna bring all that stuff. I nah. was gonna. I thought it was gonna be corny, but I was gonna bring it and be like, I'm gonna do a, a reverse Nardwar. Oh, and like bring Nardwar. <laughs> bring my own stuff. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> reverse Nardwar. Shout to Nardwar. But shoot, man, let's wrap this up. Um, real quick, since you pretty much run the gambit from clothing, you met icons. You, you, you know, open mic, freestyles, you've been to the mainland, recorded in big studios, small studios. I mean, you've kind of done it all as a Hawaii artist. You know what I mean? Like, what is your advice? What can you give to the next generation of Hawaii artists, you know, that's trying to come up mm -hmm. in this day and time? All the stuff that you've known from the past till now and you continue to learn, like, what can you give? What kind of what can you, advice can you give to the next generation? The main thing that I like you know, drove me is like just appreciating the actual process, the craft, you know, like be dope, make something dope and, and take pride that it's dope. Don't like count on like other people like, you know, to, to feel gratified. You know, you should f get fulfillment out of just making music, whether you're getting recognized for it or not. Like the fulfillment comes from just like, writing that perfect 16, you know, and everybody has their own vision of, of what success means, you know. And I think in this day and age, a lot of it comes from how many eyes you have on your music or how many followers you have or, you know what I mean, if, if you're verified and this, that. But, like, at the end of the day, it's like love what you do and do it, like, put your all into it and then, like, believe in that you can do it because a lot of time you're going to be the only one there's going to be times when nobody else is going to believe it but if you know that like dude i just wrote this 16 that was like flawless airtight like i'll put this 16 up against anybody's 16 then you have you can carry that confidence and then sometimes you know you won't get any like any kind of like um uh acceptance people will not like necessarily like give you your flowers but if, as if you have a few certain people that you meet along the way and they are like you know your stuff is dope that can help you carry on for like five ten years after that like you Definitely. know what? forget what this guy said you know forget what all of these people said this one guy who i really respect said i'm dope so i can like you know you, that's like a badge of honor that you carry with you so it's like it's all about the craft at the end of the day it's about skill attention to detail putting in the hours and making something that's dope. And if you do that, you're also going to be making something that's timeless. Yeah. Solid. And that's it. Tasho Pierce, thanks for coming through. Thank you, Cav. Alanui Mele with Cav at the Catalyst on PBS Hawaii. Love. Peace. <laughs>